those who are unruly. Comfort the faint-hearted. Uphold the weak. Be patient with all. Verse 15. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourself and for all. Amen. This morning, as I'm about to teach, this is the purpose for the teaching this morning, that we will see the need as a church to give mentorship to others and receive mentorship from others. Amen. So give mentorship and receive mentorship from others. Some people's contributions to your life can make all the difference you need. Your contribution to another person's life can make all the difference in that person's life. But that will come when we see that mentorship is very important. And my prayer is that by the time I end today's sermon, we will see that mentorship is important. Either giving it or receiving it. Amen. Ask for me again, who are you mentoring? And ask the person, who is mentoring you? Amen. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 14 to 15. Now in this verse, verse 14 and 15, we are going to identify five categories of people that are in the church that we can easily ignore. They are in the church. We may think they are outside, but they are in the church and we can easily ignore. Now let's go. He said, now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly. The first category it's what we call, this is how one man of God classified. The first is the wayward. Say it in the wayward. And New King James called them unruly. It's like we are going, we are walking in line, but these people are walking out of line. We are going according to a line, but they are walking out of line. So the first group of people is unruly. And these people must be warned. If you are in this church and even in your life, nobody can call you and warn you, then you are in big, big trouble. The first category of people that are in the church are to be warned. That's called the wayward. The second group of people is what we call the worried. Say with me, the worried. And King James says, the faint-hearted. These people have to be comforted. These people have to be encouraged. And I know most of you, some of us are here, we want somebody to encourage us. There are things that God wants us to do, but we are faint-hearted. We need encouragement. We need people to comfort us. The worried or the faint hearted. These people have to be encouraged. These people have to be comforted. The next people is what we call the weak. And the Bible said, uphold the weak. Now, the weak here refers to those who are new in the faith and those who lack spiritual maturity. It refers to those who easily yield to one particular sin or temptation or the other. And these people are in the church. These people are not just to be discussed, they have to be helped. They are to be upheld. And that's where mentorship will come in. These people have to be kept accountable to someone to help them grow. And these people are in the church and can easily be ignored. Let's move on. The fourth group of people is what we call the worrisome. The worrisome, I will explain. Now, you continue to say, be patient with all. So this one class of people that you have to be very patient. The worrisome. Now, these are people who, they come to church, they study the Bible, they pray, but it's as if nothing is happening to your life. You are mentoring them. You are teaching them. You are, you are exposing them to all that need, they need to grow, but they are not growing. These people, you have to be patient with them. They are like the bamboo, bamboo plants. For a period, it will seem as if nothing is happening. By a time will come, they will spring forth. And they are, they are grow to be very tall. And you have this category of people here. The, the important thing you have to do is that we are not supposed to give up on these people. You have to be patient with them. Amen. So that's the worry. So the final one, the classification is very strong, but just bear with me. It's the wicked. I'm not saying that wicked people are here, but this refers to people who can pay evil for evil. Somebody has offended them in the church and they can pay evil for evil. And these people, the Bible said, see to it. See to it that no one... There can be people here who can easily offend people and pay back people with evil. And these people too have to be attended to. These people are not outside the church. They are inside the church. Okay. And it's easy for us to ignore these people. And let's, let's know that from time to time, each one of us fall under this category. There will be a time that you need somebody to warn you. There will be a time you need somebody to encourage you. There will be a time you need somebody to uphold you. There will be a time you need some people to be patient with you. And there will be a time where you need people to see to it that you don't pay evil for evil. Because you may be so offended by your Christian brother or Christian sister. And you want to pay back evil. 
but it will take some people's intervention to keep you on track. Amen. So we have these five categories of people. And today I'm going to narrow down to the third category I mentioned, which is the weak. The weak. The new in the faith. And we can easily ignore these people. Are they here or are they outside? They are here. And who is supposed to attend to them? Let me give you answers, like possible answers. The first one is pastor and session. And the second one is all of us. What will be the answer? All of us. Okay. But in practice, all of us are not really involved. And this morning, as I teach, I pray that we all come on board and offer mentorship to the weak. Amen. Amen. As I was talking about the weak, the weak. So people are saying, oh, me, I am not weak. So I'm not part of it. Now, I'm going to spread this definition so that the weak here will, inc- like, will include people. If you are weak spiritually, either in prayer or Bible studies, you are part. If you are weak in your marriage, you are part. If you are weak in your business or in your school, you are part. If you are weak in your finance, you are part. All these people need to be mentored. And it includes me. It includes you. Amen. Amen. God's plan for the church is that none shall be weak among us. Say with me, none shall be weak among us. That's God's plan for the church. His plan is that we be so stable that we will not be tossed about by every wind of doctrine. His plan is that we will be rooted and built up and established in the faith. That's his plan for us as a church. And that will happen only if we take up mentorship of those who are weak among us. Sometimes I will be weak. Another time you may be weak. And it will take mentorship of one another to rise to the occasion. Amen. Some of you are here and wondering, what is the bridge between where I am now and where I am to get to? The answer is mentorship. And if you, t- if you take what I'm going to teach you seriously and pick up mentorship, that will be the difference in your life. And you are wondering, how can I contribute so much to somebody's life that it will make a big difference in that person's life? The answer is mentorship. If you mentor that person, you'll be glad you did. Amen? Gradually, the church is giving up on people that you are not supposed to give up on. But then it is up for us as a church to rise and say, there is hope for you. That though you may be cut down, you can grow again when you sense water. And I pray that the church will rise up to the occasion. Amen? Amen. What does it mean to mentor? To mentor means to guide someone or to coach the person. So it means to mentor. It means to guide or to coach. To guide or to coach. And a lot of things go on doing mentorship. But two things are very important. I want us to remember is counsel and correction. Say with me, counsel and correction. Counsel and correction. Very important. These are the two things that happen during mentorship. You'll be counseled or given advice on various issues and you'll be corrected. Amen? Very soon I'll show you how powerful mentorship is. These are important. And the goal of mentorship is that by the time you have gone through that mentorship or you have mentored somebody, the person should be able to stand on his feet when you are not around. So if you are mentoring somebody, let's say in prayer, and you have to be there before the person is praying. They have not completed your assignment. But when you are gone, when you are away, if the person can stand on his or her own and pray and stand on his or her own and do what you are supposed to do, that person can be saved to be mentored. Some of us, we come to church only before we pray. That means that our mentorship has not been completed with you. Okay. So the church is going to train us in various things. We can be said to have been fully mentored if we can stand on our own and do them. Amen. So we have our choristers here. They sing. Okay. They are being given rehearsals, like they go through rehearsals and all. But if on their own they can't do any of such, then their mentorship is still questionable. They are not really taking instructions. Okay. But if they can stand on their own and do what they have been assigned to do, then we can say that we are making progress. Amen. I tell you, mentorship is powerful. Mentorship is powerful. Now, let's know these two things about mentorship. Are you with me so far? Are you with me so far? Let's know these two things about mentorship. The first is that mentorship determines how successful or not you become. Mentorship has been found out that it has made some people successful. It has made some people failures. That's how powerful mentorship is. Let me illustrate. I want two men. Please, the two of you come. Let's clap for them as they come. You, I'm just going to use them to illustrate how mentorship uh, is powerful. There was a study that was done, I think in the U.S. I read about it. And it, was, it has to do with two men. What happened was that they blindfolded them. Okay. 
So they blindfolded their eyes. Then they took a toy and they broke it into pieces, like they disjointed the parts. Then they gave it to each of them and said, fix it. Okay, they have been blindfolded. So it's very difficult to locate where the tie is, where this part is, where this part is. But then for one, they brought somebody, an expert behind one, and the person would just say, yes, no, no, yes, 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 no, yes, no. This man who had the expert behind him finished in no time. Within a very short period, he finished. What was the other one? He, has not even, he doesn't even know what he is doing. Somebody's yes, somebody's no in your life can make all the difference. If for some of us, if you look back at your life, if you have had somebody say something to you at one point of your life, or somebody giving you an advice about an issue at one point of your life, your life would have been made a little progress than it is before. Mentorship is powerful. Please, let's take a seat. Mentorship is powerful. So that's how powerful mentorship is. Like when you have somebody behind you, even just saying yes, no, not even giving you a long lecture, just saying yes or no, is enough to make all the difference in your life. Amen? Amen. So that's how powerful mentorship is. But we know that mentorship is powerful, but not everybody wants to be engaged in mentorship. Why? Because mentorship is not easy. To mentor someone is like parenting. It is not that easy. And let me illustrate with this. There was a church that was trying to renovate their building. Just like we have built one at Christian Village. Let's say we want to, we want to renovate this place. But then they have to do two things. The first thing they have to do is that they have to break certain parts. Okay, so that's the first part of the work, the first phase. They have to break certain parts. So they invited the guys, come, we want to break. Let's say we're going to break all these glasses. We're going to break all these uh, TNG. We're going to break all of them. Now, for that phase of that work, a lot of people came aboard. Look at how easy it is. Come and break the glasses. They just smangled, tore, broke everything down. And within a very short period, they had finished that part. Now, the second part was rebuilding that building. And that part, it took few people. It took people who were experts. It took people time before that part. They have to redesign, rebuild, design a lot of things. It took a long time. Okay, and that's how life can be. If you want to break somebody's life, if you want to break people's life, it's very easy. And it can, you can finish without any skill or training. You don't have to be trained to break somebody's life. But when it comes to building other people's life, that one takes time. Just like the building, it takes time, it takes skill, it takes a lot of patience to be able to design something to become nice. Amen? And so, though mentorship is, is, uh, is difficult, as I've said, and will easily go to, towards the side of breaking people's lives instead of building it. I want to encourage you at the church. God wants his people built. We have to go to the side of the building or rather the side of the breaking. We have to look beyond every difficulty that mentorship can give you and go towards the building part. Amen. Are you with me so well? Okay. Let's work towards the building. The church is a place where people are to be built up, not broken down. If the people go to the world and the world break their lives into pieces, when they come to the church, we are to build them up. We are to bring them back to their feet. And that's where you and I belong. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I'm going to give this morning, I'm going to give two words of advice for those of us who want to give mentorship to others. And one word of advice for those of us who want to receive mentorship from others. We will have to be in both. We will have to give mentorship. We have to receive mentorship. And I pray that you catch this Rema, that I'm going to give you. Amen. Amen. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. I think I'll read from the board. Matthew 5, 13 and 14. Matthew 5, 13 and 14. Okay. It says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. The next verse. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Amen? So from this verse, I want to bring out a few things that would help. Then I'll connect our earlier readings to it so that we get a full picture. Amen? Now what this verse is saying, this is the speaking of Jesus, is that we are people of influence. Tell the person about you, you are a person of influence. Yes, just like salt, 
a little amount of salt, when you put it in a soup, it can change everything about the soup. Or you take a small piece of light and you shine it in a, in a very dark place, it can drive away that large amount of darkness. That's how powerful Christians are. We are people of influence. Okay? But then there are things that make us stay as people of influence. And if you want to mentor others, I want to teach you two things from this verse that we have to do to remain relevant when it comes to mentorship. Amen? Amen? Are you with me so far? I want to know you are with me before I continue. Are you with me? Alright, so what is the word of advice? Now the first is that there must be a relationship. Say with me, there must be a relationship. See, and this relationship must be built on trust. I will show you in the verse we read in Ruth and you will know. Now, just like a salt, let's assume I have, I have, let's say this, I assume this is a, a jar of salt. And this is my soup. If I put the salt beside uh, the food, will it season it? No. What about if I pass it around it? So if you, if you just sit by somebody or you sleep in the same room by somebody or you just come to church and you pass around that person, that doesn't mean that you are mentoring the person. You can still not influence that person's life. The first, is, the first is that the salt must come in contact with the soup. That's when the effect will be seen. If you want to mentor others, it will begin by a relationship. Amen? Amen. Now, when you read the book of Ruth, chapter 3, verse 5, Ruth, chapter 3, verse 5, you realize that in the earlier verse, Naomi gave Ruth a series of instructions. He gave her a series of instructions. Do this. Go to the field of Boaz. Do that. Do that. And verse 5 says, And she said to her, All that you say to me, I will do. All that you say to me, I will do. You will not say this to everybody. Then somebody comes to you and the person talks to you. say, All that you say to me, I will do. You cannot say it to everybody. You will say it to people you have a relationship with and the people you trust. If you really want to influence or mentor the weak people here, what it will require is that we have to build a relationship with them. Jesus built a relationship with Peter. That's why you can look at Peter and say, Peter, Satan has asked of you. He desires to sift you. Let's assume Peter was somewhere else. How would Jesus have gotten the information to him? They had a relationship. That is required. Now, in the case of Jesus and Peter, this is how the relationship built. Jesus went to Peter and said, Peter, follow me. So, the lesson is that for some mentorship relationship, you, the person, the mentor, you have to go to the mentee or the person who wants to mentor and said, I want to mentor you. That's one aspect of it. That's one such. But when you look at Ruth and Naomi, it was, it was Ruth who held on to Naomi and said, uh -huh. wherever you go, I'll follow you. Your God will be my God. Your people, my people. So, in this case, it was Ruth that approach Naomi. So, in certain cases, you, the mentee, you have to approach the mentor and say, mentor, I need you. I am struggling in these areas. I need your help. Help me. You realize that even in the account you read in Ruth, that's in the earlier account, I think Ruth 1.16. Give me Ruth 1.16. In Ruth 1.16, you will notice that yeah, this is Ruth said, but Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or turn back from following after you. Right? That Naomi was driving her away. She was driving. She said, oh, go back to your people. The people you marry, my sons that you marry, they are dead. Go back to your people. But I said, entreat me not. So in certain cases, the person, your mentor may drive you away. You may say, oh, I don't have time. I am busy and all. But you say, no, entreat me not to turn back from you but I'll follow you. Amen? So that, the first is that there must be a relationship. Just like the salt will, must come in contact with the food. If you don't build the relationship, there can be no mentoring. Because the Bible likening, likens correction like picking something from somebody's eyes. Okay? So I was I don't know you. How can I pick something from your eyes? You will close your eyes. Okay? So if there's no relationship... It's very difficult to pick something from somebody's eyes. You cannot just go to somebody and say, point your hand at the person's face. The person will close their eye. So if you don't have any relationship with somebody and you want to correct that person, the person will close himself up. But if there's a relationship, the person can say, Kwame, you are misbehaving. 
or Kwame, do this, this, that. So the first is that there must be a relationship. Say with me, there must be a relationship. And God help us, those of us who are quiet and reserved, like me. When it comes to mentorship, you have to open up. Otherwise, people will not be blessed. You have to open up ourselves. And despite we are quiet and reserved, you have to approach the people and build that relationship with them. You will not go straight forward and say, I want to mentor you. But it may begin by just casual relationship. Gradually, it will grow. Amen. The second thing that is, I want us to learn from the salt. So the first is that the salt must come in contact with the food. That's the first. The second is that the salt must be, let me use one strong word, it must be potent. What I mean is that the salt must remain powerful. It must not lose its strength. Amen. Let's assume I have a big jar of salt and I pour half into a soup and the soup does not change. What will I do? That's the Bible said, I will throw it away. Then I will get a new one. If you want to mentor people, that, the lesson is that we ourselves, we have to be strong. You want to mentor the weak, so you yourself have to be strong. If you want to mentor somebody's marriage, and you see that the person's marriage is weak, yourself, you have to be strong. You have to have a strong marriage. Nothing speaks like example. If an example of something is very easy, you don't have to talk too much. Let's assume Bragosway comes here, and we have asked Bragosway to come and talk about prayer. You have seen that Bagosu have been leading prayer for some time now. When he's talking about prayer, you will listen. You will listen. Why? Because he's, you can see that that's part of his life. If you want to mentor people, the next thing is that we must be potent. We must be strong in the areas that I want to mentor the people in. If you're not strong in that area, there's very little you can help that person. Amen. So that is the second. The first is that we must build a relationship. The second is that we must be strong in the areas we want to mentor the people in. What made Peter leave his business and follow Jesus? Peter was having a very good business, fishing. Then Jesus walked to him and said, Peter, follow me. And the Bible said, immediately, he left everything and followed Jesus. Would you do that? Somebody comes to your workplace and said, Kwame, follow me. Leave everything and follow me. Would you do that? No. But what, what made Peter do that. Because he read that Jesus had something. Jesus was worth following. Jesus is worthy to be a leader over him. Amen? It was interesting. I heard some time back that even Peter was older than Jesus. I'm here to get the proof. Even Peter. So sometimes, in the mentorship relationship, you can be older than a person. But because that person has the quality you admire, you have to follow the person. So if you want to mentor people, you must have those qualities. Amen? Are you with me so far? Yes. That you, must have, you must be an example of that qualities. You want to encourage students to go to school. Yourself, push yourself, go to school. Then you can tell them, follow me, let's go. The person is complaining, they had difficulty, said, oh, in my case, it was safe, let's go. If you want to mentor somebody in prayer, you tell the person, first you have to show it by your life example. You can't make a lot of impact in people's life if you're not the example of what you're talking about. And my prayer is that we will work on ourselves so that we don't have to talk too much to convince people that we want to mentor them. They will see themselves and say, please, I need help in these and these areas. Then you can offer that help. The weak among us, which include you and I, are looking around for people who are strong to follow. And we must be part of it. Amen? Amen. Amen. I've been so far. Now, the mentee. So the piece of advice for those who want to mentor others is that first, we have to build a relationship. And second, we have to be strong in the areas we want to train the people in. For the mentee, those who want to be mentored, also including you and I, one of the things you have to do is that we have to show our need for the mentor. We have to show our need for the mentor. We have to show our need for the mentor. You see, one man... When he turned 17 years, his name is Joshua Harris, his father told him something. And it really made a difference in his life. His father said, there will come a stage in your life as you are growing now, he was 17 years. There are a lot of lessons that are not in books. They will not be taught in school, but they are hidden in people's lives. It is up to you to locate those people and learn from them. What we have written in our books, the books we sell on the market, is not everything about life. People have secrets. 
and they will only share it with people who really, 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 really need it. If you don't need it, they won't give it to you. I remember a time, there was a time we, the, we, the youth, those of us who had climbed a little higher, we wanted to mentor those who are going to write their uh, SSE, the WASI. And it was amazing. Some of the days, you come and sit here, you the teacher, come and sit here, and the students will take all their time before they come. The teachers will come and wait for the students. It doesn't show that you really need a person. They give you four o'clock. What do you do? You come at four. That shows how serious you are. That shows how you really need it. Otherwise, the person will cut it. I want to finally say that the solutions that we need, okay, to get us to the next stage, is not far from us. I look back at my life and that the solutions are not very far. They are close by. But it will take mentorship. It will take your humility. It will take your teachability to receive from other people and your life will turn around. Amen. I want to encourage us finally, no matter how small you think your contribution is, I want you to give it to others. I want you to give it to the people in this church. I want to give it to the people you are seeing around. And that can make all the difference in their lives. I remember there was a boy in our area, down our area. I met him years back. And he had finished SS. I know he had finished SS, but he had not fed it. So I asked him, like, what is the problem? We had a relationship. I knew him. So he told me a lot of stories about how things are going on. And it was true. I knew about his family, so I know how things were difficult. But I encouraged him. I told him something. I just, I just said something. I told him. And that was what he remembered. He said, I told him, he should go. He should buy the forms, apply, and go to the school. Those who are saying that they don't have money, they will get the money and they will support him. That's what I told him. And I encouraged him further, and he left. I didn't follow up on him. I forgot about him. I went to Kumasi. I was in Kumasi. When I came back, I met him again. I'm like, oh. I didn't follow up on this guy. Trouble for me. I asked him, how far with what we discussed? His answer was, was surprising. He looked at me and said, I am in fourth year UPSC. I'm like, what? Fourth year UPSC. So that means that four years I had already, I didn't even realize. Then he said, I said, how did you, like, how did he manage? He said, oh, I went. And the people who, who said they didn't have money, they are the ones who supported me. I was, I, was, I was amazed. Then he even added that um, Access Bank has employed him on campus and for commission basis. He gets student customers for them and they pay him. And that's how he's even, he manages. Other times, he's even able to raise part of the fees from that money. And I was surprised. I'm like, this small thing I shared with this boy, look at how it changed his four years. And it is having changed his life. Just that small word of advice. I didn't even follow up on him. I forgot about him. But it made a lot of difference. I want you to know that even the little that you can share with somebody can make the difference. Let's look around. The Lord is calling us this morning that we should open our hearts. We should open our homes. We should open our life to some people so that they can benefit from what we know. Some of us, we know so much, but we have seated here quietly. The Lord is calling us, rise up. Rise up. Open your life to people. Some of us, we are here and some people are approaching us repeatedly that they need help, but we have not really given them attention. The Lord is calling us. Attend to these people. Their destinies are connected to your life. Attend to them. Amen. And some of us, we are here and we are struggling in certain areas and we have still closed our lives to people who can help us. I encourage us this morning that open up yourself. Just one solution. Just one word of advice from that person can change your life all around. Amen. My prayer is that as the Lord has said that none shall be weak among us, that shall be our story. Because we will mentor the weak. We will open our lives to the weak. We ourselves, when we identify we are weak, we will approach help and receive the strength. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless us as we are doers of his word. Amen. Amen. Shall we pray? Shall we pray? Father, we say thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word that has come. I pray that, Lord, your word will bless your people as you have planned it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hallelujah.
we thank our brother Hope Fiajo. Hallelujah. A pharmacist, but gradually he's turning into a preacher. Hallelujah. We thank God for his life. Those who have paid their covenant pledge, can we please step forward as we pray? Covenant pledge, the white card. Those who have paid their covenant pledge this morning, please step forward quickly. Today, for the past two weeks, we have not had uh, uh, serious praises. So this morning, we want to give some time to give praise to God, to thank God. Hallelujah. Other than that, mentor will be annoyed with me. Shall we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the life of these ones that have paid their covenant play. They have covenanted with you to support your work. And in your covenant, you promise that 